All right, everyone has been talking about the Fire Festival recently because there were these two documentaries that just came out. One is on Hulu, one is on Netflix. Um, did you watch them? No, I didn't. They're pretty good. Um, it, it captures the millennial zeitgeist, I feel like. What do you mean by that? Oh, in the sense that um, the the guys that organized the Fire Festival, they like understood what aspirational music festivals were for like a generation of people. Mm. And they realized that you could just, even if you had none of the logistics figured out and none of the bands booked, you could still get signups just by like capturing that and selling it. Yeah. Hype and marketing. Yeah. Just hype and marketing and like, Hey, we're on the Bahamas and all these cool celebrities are marketing it. And right, yeah. even if you knew nothing about it, even if it's just a, like a blank box on the inside, you could still sell it because you're just there, you know. On because the, they in, captured the millennial dream. Yeah, exactly. So I, I thought it was interesting from that respect, and it's it goes kind of exactly how you think. Like, oh wow, you're going to throw a music festival in the Bahamas? Like, what are the logistics like? It's like I feel like with things like music festivals and parties, like logistics actually rule everything. Like, hmm. like the thing that actually makes a good party is a good logistics. No, but so and you also need a strong meme. Like, I watched the promo video of it, and they said an island that Pablo Escobar used to own? Yeah, it's actually a plot in <laughs> the the Netflix movie that's really funny because it was an island that Pablo Escobar used to own and that's how they marketed it because it was cool. Yeah, this But the guy that owns like the that. island now, like th Pablo Escobar was horrible. He was like running drugs and like murdering people right, on his right, island. Right. Yeah. So he is trying to disassociate this island from Pablo Escobar yeah. and he told them straight up, like, do not say this was Pablo Escobar's <laughs> island. Like, I do not want that association. Yeah. And immediately, the next day, they, like, ran a massive ad, like, Pablo Escobar's <laughs> private island. And the guy just goes, you're not using this island. And he kicked them off immediately. Huh. And they had to find a new island, which is one of the reasons the logistics got so messed up. Oh, interesting. It's such a fascinating story. <laughs> but the reason um, I wanted to talk about that was because I think through, like, learning about Fire Festival and, like, iterating on what, like, actually happened and what it meant was how I came across Billion Dollar Whale, okay, which is the book that we actually want to talk about. Yeah, I was wondering how you figured it, like how you came across it. Yeah, so um, I was just in that mood of like reading about like great scams that have happened in the last decade. Yeah. And to <laughs> big Billion Dollar Whale is the whale of all scams. That was a terrible point. Yeah, the Moby Dick of scams. Yeah, I apologize. But anyway, so <laughs> the, the real high level overview here is there's a guy named Joe Lowe that stole $4 billion from the Malaysian government and associated Arab sovereign wealth funds. And, epic. So epic. And, used, and Goldman Sachs. Yeah, and, and used it to party around the world in, in really a way that makes Wolf of Wall Street look tame. Um, it, it is the predecessor to Wolf of Wall Street, though. That's why it's so interesting. He was partying with Leonardo DiCaprio and Paris Hilton and all these people. Yeah, it's it, so oh, man, the story's good, and we're going to dive into it. But I, I want to just preface it um, with, with, with a couple things. So one, what Jolo did is obviously horrific. Like, if you are a Malaysian citizen and you pay taxes to the government and had it stolen by this dude that used it to party around the world, like, you're obviously going to dislike him. And that's completely reasonable and I understand it. But, Matt, he's kind of a legend, right? <laughs> yeah, I think so. So also, <laughs> it's interesting to me that there were points in the story that he's kind of how to say, misappropriated this billions of dollars. But there were certain times when the author was saying that, yeah, and then there were instances when he might have been able to pay this money back. So it's so fascinating, right? It's like he made this Wolf of Wall Street. They started this Hollywood production company. He bought a stake in EMI Music. And it's so interesting. It's just like there were times when it seemed like he would have been able to cover for it. You know, it's just fascinating. Yeah, I guess you should do like the high level. So this guy, Joe Lowe, um, and I guess the context for this discussion is Matt approached me with the question that do you think that he might be a Hall of Famer? Mm. And that, okay. So that's a, that's a bold statement to make because the people that we've inducted into our Hall of Fame have done like really, like they're really impactful on the world. Yeah. So I'm like, ah, man, is he a Hall of Famer? But when you're in the tier of stealing billions of dollars, it's kind of like, all right, we'll, we'll hear the bid. Let's let's hear the story here. It's not stealing billions of dollars that gets you, like, a Hall of Fame bid. I feel like it's basically, like, the situation of the reasonable man adapts himself to the world and the unreasonable man adapts the world himself. And so it's, for me, how much are you able to adapt the world to yourself? And Joe Lowe's sitting around thinking, okay, I exist in this planet, in this earth, 
And there's people that are really doing their thing. So he looks at somebody like Paris Hilton or anything. He says, yeah, she's doing her thing. I want to be friends with her. And he just makes it happen. He's like, yeah, now we're friends. It's crazy. Yeah, I guess the story, we should give like a quick overview of the story um, so that we can analyze it further. But I guess, so Joe Lowe is just, um, he's from money in Malaysia, but like, as Peter Thiel would say, single digit millionaires, maybe. Yeah, yeah. So like he's a single digit millionaire family. They get he goes to the U.S. to study. He studies at UPenn. No, he studied at Harrow, like this bougie British boarding school. But he was at UPenn. Sure, sure. For undergrad, for, I think. Yeah, yeah, for college. But yeah, for, for college, and then yeah, he... yeah. Also, I feel like Penn is the the weakest of the Ivy League schools. I mean, I think Brown and Dartmouth are the weakest, and then Penn <laughs> is like the next weakest. I th- yeah. I I mean, it really depends what vector you're. Elon Musk went on. there, and so did Donald Trump. Yeah. Elon Musk dropped out of college, though, right? I think he studied at Penn for like a year. Yeah, yeah, but he definitely did not graduate college. He started Zip 2 when he was like 19 or something. I'm pretty sure he did go to college. He studied in Canada for a while and then went to Penn for a while. Huh. I remember, because I read that Ashley Vance book about Elon Musk. And so I did I. It was, it was a big deal that he didn't go to, like he dropped out of college and started this business. Didn't he drop out of PhD program though? Or like he never even Maybe. was in the PhD program? I can't swear to it. I, I don't, right, I can't right, swear We're getting it. off the rails also. <laughs> yeah. But um. So anyway, he just studies abroad, but... He is intoxicated by this kind of social status in the U.S. of people thinking he's cool. Mm -hmm. And he just takes it to a level that is like like literally no other person on the planet has probably taken that desire for social status and just willingness to do anything to achieve it to the level he takes it throughout this story. Um, And he decides, like, I want to play with the big boys but I don't want to like work up a corporate ladder to do it. I want to just completely. Yeah, which is dope. That's cool. I want to hack the system. This is all famous. Oh yeah. Okay. So, th- this idea, I think, of how can I manipulate the global financial system to my advantage? It's like okay. So like, Y Combinator always says this. They say it's easier to work on a super ambitious company than a moderately ambitious company, because if you say something like, "Hey, I want to make like satellite." Um, infrastructure like 10 percent more efficient you're not going to recruit the best talent but if you say i want to land on mars like the way elon musk did you're going to get everyone in the world you know behind your inspiration because you're Mm. just so it's like it's almost that it's easier to make a billion dollar company than a 10 million dollar company that's interesting and that's what i think that this joe low story is is he's saying it's almost easier to steal like a billion dollars than to steal like a hundred thousand dollars yeah like that quote if you borrow a little the bank owns you but if you borrow a lot you own the bank yeah, I mean it's on that level, maybe. But so I forget the exact. I don't know. Can you? Do you like? Can you, like, um, articulate the actual one MDB scandal, like what he physically did? Yeah. So as I recall, it starts off with he is in college, and then he's just balling out in college all the time, hard, like having parties and trying to meet cool and interesting people who are really rich, and then just become friends with them. And so Malaysia is a Muslim country, and he just gets in tight with these dudes from the UAE. And then he's just, like, always trying to, like, scheme and, like, level up his connections and, like, get introduced to important people. And then he meets one of these princes from UAE who is, like, in charge of some money or anything like this, or even, like, diplomats in the United States. And then he tries to set up some deal where he is, like, having some kind of... A foreign investment in to Malaysia from UAE and just kind of like scheming and stuff he like sets up this uh one MDB which stands for one Malaysia development bank and uh yeah like then just cipher the first thing they do is to build some housing whatever inside of Kuala Lumpur city and they're getting a big invest they they kind of project that they're getting a lot of investment from from Middle East. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and then they get money from the Malaysian government to invest alongside of it. But then he goes around the world setting up these fake shell companies that look like they're these UAE companies. And then, yeah, like the UAE sovereign wealth funds, he just creates a company with the same name, but it's based in the Cayman Islands or something, controlled by him. Actually controlled by this dude he knows called Fat Eric in the whole book. And then he's just like a dummy that he uses to set up all these things. He even uses Fat, like Eric Tan, Eric Tan at Gmail, but it's actually him, so funny. And yeah, like they, so the first thing that happens is he just sends $700 million to himself from this deal and then just pretends that the deal is still going down. And he's like homies with the son of the prime minister of Malaysia. 
And yeah, it's so interesting. He's like using this money to kind of buy nice gifts and so on for the president of Malaysia, and then just also using it for himself to just party in New York, like clubs and Saint Tropez and so on. That was so interesting. So like, he just goes after. He's thinking to himself, "I want to be this rich, successful, high status guy, and I need a lot of money and connections to do it." So who has a lot of money? Uh, Arab governments, you know, like Saudi princes. They've got a lot of money. Yeah. So he literally, instead of just dying on that idea is like let me go meet all the saudi princes like he takes it to that next level yeah meets all the saudi princes and convinces them to invest in like a sovereign wealth fund for malaysia so like malaysian development and says oh you're gonna get so much return on your investment and can and yeah he can like the i guess the structure of the organizations are just so ambiguous in that region and in this like new emergent oil wealth sovereign wealth stuff that he was able to manipulate it so that the actual money just went to his own private bank account instead of to any actual development fund. And then he just hired all his friends to cover for him and make it look like a legit operation. Yeah, but think about the balls of this guy. So he just <laughs> wires $700 million from this stupid investment to himself. And then people are asking him about it and he's like, don't worry about it. And so <laughs> it's so interesting, right? Then also throughout the whole book, this guy just must know human nature so well because he's just able to manipulate so many people and like do it in such a good way that they're just not able to pin him down. And that's amazing. And also manipulate ignorance because I think that probably people said, oh yeah, Malaysia, like he could probably make a narrative that Malaysia is a good place to invest. Yeah, and, and just project. Yeah, and then people aren't going to do their homework. They're just going to be like, oh yeah, like they're talking with their friends. Like, oh, are you investing in Malaysia? I'm investing in Malaysia. And like just get the narrative to the point where like people give them the money to do it. Dude, but also just the balls of the guy are crazy. So there was this time when every time he makes these transactions, he tries to pass them through tens of bank accounts all over the world so that it gets all messed up in the jurisdiction and compliance officers can't tell where the money's coming from. So he's just sending transactions like from himself to his father to his brother to back to himself. And this bank in Switzerland is asking him, what the hell? Why are you sending this money from yourself to your father and then back to yourself? He's like, don't you guys know anything about Confucianism? It's like, we have so much respect for our elders. We have to send this money to our parents. And then my parents can decide to send it back to me, you ignorant assholes. Yeah, I like that part where he said that he had to make it look like his family was rich because yeah, yeah, yeah. he's been pitching this, that he comes from like this billionaire family, which isn't true. So he's just sending his family money from this development fund so that they can have large bank accounts. Because like, it's better for my image if you guys are baller rich. So yeah, yeah, I'm going to put $35 million in all your bank accounts. And then send it back to himself. So crazy. Yeah, it is fascinating. And the, also the, the time that this was happening was interesting because it was right at the uh, the housing market crash in the U.S. So it was like 2009. And the first thing to go in the housing market crash is like people buying $300 bottles of vodka at clubs and going to Las Vegas and spending a million dollars at a Baccarat table. Like that's the first thing to go. But this guy just had all this money and just like completely reckless with it because he stole it all. So like um, he's balling out at clubs and balling out at casinos at a time when they're desperate for a client like him. So they're, I feel like that probably helped into it too because all the clubs are like going out of their way to service him because now he's a like massive client that they desperately need. Like he made friends with these club promoters in New York that like hooked him up with like all the dopest things. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's so interesting. And then one of the, the interesting things is now that he had all this like money, he decided eventually after he's blown hundreds of millions of it that he needs to actually make some investments because that was his logic. Like, Hey, I'm just gonna blow hundreds of millions, but then I'll still have hundreds of millions left. And then I can like invest in stuff and hopefully make a return and then pay all my investors back. Mm. So it wasn't like even like a Ponzi scheme. It was just like he <laughs> it was just a, it was a so interesting, interesting scam. Though, that he also wanted yeah. the Malaysian government to write off the debt at some point, like just write <laughs> off billions of dollars of debt. It's so interesting. Well, yeah, because it was uh, like the way that so he has um, Goldman Sachs bankers come and broker deals with him that they know are shady, but they know that they get a percentage of the deal. Yeah, yeah. So they're totally down to do it because they're like, wow, we're going to just get 6% of this $100 million deal and just close, you know, $10 million in like a week for just doing this. And like some rock star banker that just went out to Asia to make all these crazy deals. Like if I close a $10 million deal for Goldman Sachs, in, like my first week out in Malaysia, like. This is gonna, I'm gonna be a rock star at Goldman Sachs. So they don't even care that all this stuff is shady. It, you know, it's like playing on everyone's incentives in the global financial system. Like no one is actually there at the top. It's a, it's a Moloch coordination problem. Like if you've ever read that uh, Scott Alexander essay, Meditations on Moloch, which is really good. Um, I'm not gonna dive into the whole thing. I'll give like the quick overview, but it's mm -hmm. like really good. But he, there's like this Allen Ginsberg poem um, called Howl that's really famous. 
but in how he like there's this monster from like eastern asian mythology called Moloch that's like some weird kraken thing mm. and alan ginsburg um wrote this poem that's really good um where he compares the ills of society to Moloch, and he's like oh yeah this is all Moloch's fault but because the whole point of the essay is that by comparing things that are terrible in society and saying oh this eastern asian demon is responsible for it he's drawing the analogy that of course the eastern asian demon is not responsible for it it's obviously us mm -hmm. right and the scott alexander who is this prolific writer in silicon valley wrote an essay like expanding on alan ginsburg's essay where he says the Moloch problems, like the things that are obviously us in society, are just coordination problems, hmm. where if there was only one global entity that could just look at the situation and be like, okay, this is obviously the rule, and you all need to go to, like, like the prisoner's dilemma, right? So the prisoner's dilemma, you know, two people, if they both agree to yeah, yeah, yeah. not snitch, then they get out together if they tell, if I, like, so it, the incentive is better for everyone if they just agree to do the same thing. But their individual incentive is better to do one specific thing that is different than the global incentive. No, it isn't, though. So this is always the thing about the prisoner's dilemma, right? It's like if they both don't snitch, they both, what, go to jail for one year? So it's, it's something like if they – so, like, you have two prisoners. Yeah. And the guy says if you tell – on like, the other – if you rat out your other um, – Then you go free and he goes to jail for life. Then you go to free and he goes to jail for life. Yeah. If he rats you out – like he, then he goes go free life. and you go to jail yeah, for life yeah if you so like but if you don't rat each other out you both go to jail for a year yeah so it's like the best situation for both participants is if neither of them rat each other out and they just both go to jail for but a year. the best for each one but the best you, for each yeah, one yeah. is to just rat the other person yeah, yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. so this is the coordination problem issue it's like if only there was some and like there's a solution to the prisoner's dilemma it's like the godfather the godfather that says i will shoot both of you if you snitch the other person out that's the solution of the prisoner's dilemma, is that you have some entity right. at one higher level that can enforce coordination when no individual incentive, right? Right, right, right. So right, this right, whole right. essay by Scott Alexander is Yeah, that's about, why like, mobsters don't rat each other out, because they'll get killed, wouldn't they? Yeah, like, so yeah, the whole essay is about the different things in society that are these kind of coordination problems, where if only there was a global entity to solve it, then you could easily have great solutions to things, but you don't. Um, and I think that that global financial system, like the, a lot of this book is expo exploring this, the ways that global finance, finance is Moloch problems, where there's no one entity that can like audit this entire system or has the jurisdiction or responsibility to. So you get these like weird individual incentives to do like really perverse things. I've always thought of this prisoner's dilemma in terms of bourgeois morality, actually. So I think that bourgeois morality is like this construct that like helps everyone in the population to act in some way which is beneficial to you could say people in society who don't have this morality like social elites or anything like this like people who are like top of whatever at goldman sachs who know that joe lowe is just ripping off the entire malaysian economy but don't care <laughs> but like on a normal level like in normal society they're like everyone should like you know what i mean just behave in this little like bourgeois morality istic way but like we social elites will not do that and so they're like we're gonna force you to like not rat us out but we will rat you out and we'll walk free and you go to jail for life what are you saying are you saying that the prisoner's dilemma is something that i just like think about this in society that it's kind of like this prisoner's dilemma thing where like one party is like constricted by this yeah sure by this uh i don't know way this like thought mechanism and another not so like one is like perfectly happy to rat out the other and then the other just like suffers the consequences of that oh are you are you saying the the like con the george orwell communism thing that some animals are more everyone's equal but some animals are more equal than others yeah 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 so then all the animals that like are yeah all animals are like equal whatever they just like behave in this very circumscribed way whereas like the pigs in that george orwell book just do whatever they want and this is similar to me to the prisoner's dilemma where so the pigs are like you better not rat us out nobody rats anybody out and then so they keep quiet while the pigs rat everybody out oh uh, yeah i i, I kind of get at what you're saying at but I'm trying to remember the tangent that I went on to even get to this point in the first place. Um, 
Oh yeah, so I was talking about yeah this like crazy web of global elite financial system there. Um, yeah, I don't remember the original point that I was making, but th man, there's so many fascinating anecdotes from this story. So, okay, at some point he decides that he has to actually make money. And that's when he starts doing like real investment deals. And it, there was some, so one of the things he does is buys a film production company because he wants to be friends with Leo DiCaprio. This goes to the original point that you were saying about how he's just trying to enforce his will on reality, where he'll say, okay, I want to be friends with Leo DiCaprio, but Leo DiCaprio, everyone wants to be friends with him. So how am I going to be friends with him? I'm going to fund his next movie. Like, okay, that's actually a viable way <laughs> to become friends with him. So he um, was talking with Martin Scorsese about making The Wolf of Wall Street. And he goes, I want to fund The Wolf of Wall Street. And normally, you know, there's probably a lot of people that would be willing to fund it. But the thing that was interesting that they told in the story was normally when you work with a production company, they give you some budget for the movie, but they're relatively reasonable with it. Like they were talking about this anecdote that Martin Scorsese said, I want to crash a real Lamborghini in this movie. Like I'm going to buy a Lamborghini and crash it. And the normal production companies in Hollywood would be like, absolutely not. That's $250,000. You could get a fake Lamborghini for $5,000 and crash it. It looks exactly the same. And that's $245,000 that we have to edit the script, like blah, blah, blah. But Joe Lowe was just like, yeah, dude, I'll give you $100 million to make this movie. And you can crash a real, like, I don't care. You just do whatever you want with it. And it's so interesting, right? Because this seems like it would be a terrible strategy for someone to make a lot of money to just be completely reckless with costs. But then because Martin Scorsese found a producer that was willing to just give him money and full creative control to do whatever he wanted, like he was able to make this movie that just, you could feel it in the movie. You could feel the ridiculousness yeah, of this it's movie. It's objectively a great movie also. Yeah, and it's... There's, there's a story to be said there about how if you just give artists full creative control and fund them and have complete faith in them, you actually get a really good product out of it as opposed to like having, but I, but I mean, obviously that works if you're working with Martin Scorsese. I don't know if it works. It's some amateur mm -hmm. director or not. Yeah, yeah. But it was just so interesting that, so one of the things he did was pay $100 million to fund The Wolf of Wall Street so that he could be friends with Leo DiCaprio. And the movie was a smash hit. And he made something like $300 million from it. Like, the movie was incredibly profitable. Right. So <laughs> it's like, even though Joe Lowe um, had stolen all this money, used it to just do ridiculous adventures around the world, and then he's like, oh, man, I need to start making money, but I want to be friends with Leo DiCaprio, so let me just, like, fund a movie. And then it starts working. He starts making money. I know, money. I know. Yeah. But then it also there are other points, too, when they were, like, trying to win the business of some, like, UAE top officials. And he was like, yeah, like, let's go hang out on my yacht. Paris Hilton's going to come. And they were, whoa, crazy. And so it was helping him to win business. So, Yeah, he, like, um, I think that they said he traveled around the world with Paris Hilton for a while. Because he saw her on TV and was like, I want to be friends with this girl. And then that <laughs> way he did it. It was also funny that they said this in The Wolf of Wall Street when, like, they were doing the original production of it. They flew Jordan Belfort out to this opening party where they were announcing the production. And he met Joe Lowe for the first time. He's like, this dude stole money. He's just like, how do you guys not realize this? Yeah. And he's the, he has the eye for it because he said, and he used a quote that I really liked where he said, nobody that worked for their money spends it like this. And I think that's a good paradigm. Like people spend money in a certain way when they've worked for it and when yeah. they like understand the value of he it. He spent $2 million on champagne at a club <laughs> in Cannes. And it reminds me, because it's so funny, because in the whole cryptocurrency ecosystem, you would go to parties and it's sponsored by Ripple, with Snoop Dogg, and it's, they did not work for their money if they're throwing this party, you know? Yeah, yeah. It has the same kind of vibe to it. Oh, man. Okay, so, yeah, so he just parties around the world, and I guess the web eventually untangles, you know, after seven or eight years of this stuff. And now he's currently on run from the DOJ and in Beijing somewhere. Yeah, but I think this is also interesting. So I traveled to Malaysia when I was living in Singapore, and... One of my memories of it, of being in Kuala Lumpur City, was that there I saw all these girls who had hijabs, but they were hijabs that were decorated with skulls and crossbones, and it was so badass. And they were riding around on skateboards, and I was just thinking to myself, this is so rad, and Islam is so dynamic. So when you live in the United States, you have this idea of Islam that it's people in Saudi Arabia just wearing burqas, but actually it's like there's also... Malaysia, which is like in Southeast Asia, girls with skull and crossbone hijabs listening to trap music and riding on skateboards is also Islam. And that was just cool. And so, yeah, also I felt 
like that I had some experience of this. So Joe Lowe was balling out in these clubs and thinking himself so cool to surround himself with celebrities from Hollywood and everything. And then I also kind of felt this when I was living in Beijing because it was in the same time period, sort of, in 2011. And there were all these nightclubs where these really rich Chinese kids whose parents were high up military officials or something would be having big parties and clubs. And if you were a foreigner, they would just want you to come to their table and drink champagne with them. And Cause it's like a status symbol. Yeah, to have it's foreigners. like, I've got foreigners hanging out with me. <laughs> I'm really cool. And yeah, that was awesome. And so I kind of felt like I knew what they were talking about when they were describing these wild Joe Lowe parties. It is interesting that we, we talk about this a lot, that there's this idea that as China becomes a global power, that there's still something where people don't perceive China as cool. And that probably mentality like extends out into the country itself. Like if you grow up in China, you're trained to think that the West is cooler than you in some, like in terms of social status. And we're just watching the slight change of it as you start getting movies like Crazy Rich Asians, which have, you know, American songs sung in Cantonese and get people singing Cantonese and you get the three body problem, which is like a cultural meme that China's export. Like we're just kind of at that cusp of that starting to turn maybe. Totally, totally. Yeah. Because it's like there's all of these <laughs> movies and music and cultural memes that are traveling from west to east. But I think that as things start to move where it's traveling from east to west, then people are going to start but it's so interesting Wanting to propagate those memes in themselves. It's so interesting how you can watch that play out in Billion Dollar Whale. And uh, uh, you can see that Joe Lowe, the way that he perceives the world, has that inferiority complex like built into it. He doesn't think of hit, like the world as having, you know, oh, these celebrities need to see how cool my life in Malaysia is. It's more that I need to like be have the cool celebrities with me to validate my own life. You know? Yeah, yeah. But also, it's deeply ingrained in the culture, as they were saying. So he grew up, and then his parents sent him to Harrow, this British boarding school, like Eton or something, because all the elites of Malaysia, were, it's like former British colony. They're, like, educated in the UK. So, yeah. I mean, but I think it's also changing, because think about this. Ray Dalio sent his kids to go to school in China for a year. I would, would totally send my kids to go to school in China. And it's just, yeah, it's definitely changing. Yeah, definitely. You feel it. I and mean, you're going to have the seven year olds now, like learn Mandarin. It's going to be 100%. the, it's going to be the thing to learn. The smart and then, ones anyway. Yeah. So you, you, people are going to start learning Mandarin young, which means they'll hear the cool Chinese folk songs when they're seven and yeah, sing yeah. those and like just propagate it into culture. Or just cool so. Chinese trap music songs and stuff. <laughs> yeah. It, it's it's going to be really interesting. And, and I mean, that we're totally going to talk about that when we talk about China's second continent because that's, oh, yeah. that. but I wanted to ask you, so, okay. So given this story, you posited to me that you think that Jolo might be a Hall of Famer. And yeah. you made a little bit of a case, but I want to hear the case. Because I would argue that he's not, and I'll give you my argument, Zach. Okay, so I would say that Jolo is a Hall of Famer because he didn't get caught. If he got, I was reading this book thinking, oh, yeah, maybe Jolo could be a Hall of Famer. But I was reading it from the perspective that I thought he got caught. And then when I find out at the end that he's still sailing the world on his yacht and just it's based in Thailand, he's still having parties with Hollywood celebrities that just come out to Bangkok to chill with him and like gets them police escorts through the city so they don't have to wait in traffic. I'm just like, this guy is killing it. Okay, so here's my thought. So if you look at the people that we said, like kind of agreed are Hall of Famers, we had uh, Joseph Patrick Kennedy and Robert Moses and William Shockley and Samuel Zemmour. Hmm. All of these people to some extent made an impact on the world where people live in their shadows. Like people mm. completely live in the shadow of Robert Moses. Like no, no matter what you do, if you live in Manhattan, yeah. you live in this guy's shadow. And you can say that, oh, I don't like the way that he built these highways. I don't like the, you know, people that he displaced to build highways. I don't right. like that he made um, the, you know, uh, northern southern state out on Long Island not friendly for buses so that poor families that were disproportionately back, black couldn't access Jones Beach. Hmm. Like you can hold those views, but you cannot argue the impact that that man had on the world. Even when, so we read this book, The Oligarchs, that we're gonna talk about. There, this guy Luzkov, who becomes the mayor of Moscow, his idol was Robert Moses. And he yeah, wanted yeah. to build Moscow in the shadow of Robert Moses. Or like in that, image. like imagine living your life in a way that reverberates around the world like that, where like n your impact is felt. What did this guy Jolo do? Okay, so he did all this cool and interesting hacks on the global financial system to acquire massive amounts of currency. Yeah. 
Yeah. But what did he do with it? He just fucking blew it, man. He would throw it on Baccarat tables and he would go give million dollar necklaces to Miranda Kerr mm. and then maybe not even bang her. It's, yeah, it's yeah. almost, there, there's a part of me that thinks that what he did is almost pathetic. It's like, you still $4 billion. That's amazing because, okay, that if you are in the U S and you still $4 billion from the government, that's incredible because we would spend it on wars and like bullshit and, you know, crazy global financial schemes. It's like, okay, you still have $4 billion. Now what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with that hack that you had? And like, if what your answer is, is, oh, I'm going to go to a Baccarat table yeah, in yeah. Las Vegas and like pretend to be cool. And I'm going to just get supermodels around me to validate my existence. Like dude, no one like looks up to Joe Lowe or like feels his impact. All right, all right. I see your point. I see your point. Yeah. Like even like the people that are crazy, like William Shockley, crazy life, but man, he invented the modern world, you know, <laughs> like the transistor is responsible for the innovation of the last 50 years. Yeah, that's true. And it's from his genius that that happens. And like Joe Lowe, there's no impact from his genius. There, there's nothing. Yeah. All right. I agree. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was my feeling about it. Also, yo, I wanted to talk about this too, because this was one of the most interesting points in the book, I thought. So at some point when he starts to feel the heat, because, oh my God, this was so interesting that he shorted one of his employees, like a couple million dollars. He oh, like, screwed yeah. him. But then that employee ended up stealing, like he cashed the email server logs from all the emails that the one on DB thing had sent. Right, right. And he, this had like a lot of dirt on like information about kind of how the sketchy transactions went down. Yeah. And it is funny because if he just didn't short this employee, maybe things wouldn't have gone so bad and ends up costing him more than the money that he shorted the employee, which is another lesson you can take out of just the world that you shouldn't screw people over because it always comes back to haunt you. Mm. But anyway, um, he, they were, they were saying that, um, Oh, it's also funny that he fired his auditors and deleted all his emails. Oh, this like, is so funny. These are just the, the funniest tells you can have that an operation is shady. Yeah. When you fire your auditors, like who fires their no, auditors? But also, it's so yeah. funny that they made this point that there's these four <laughs> big accounting things like PwC, KPMG, and whatever, like Ernest & Young and the yeah. other one. And Deloitte. Yeah, but yeah. you also, you're paying them for their services. So Ernest & Young is like, this is too sketchy. And he's like, all right, you're fired. KPMG, will you tell me it's cool? And then they're like, yeah, it's cool. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. okay, you're hired. It actually is. Uh, when, when I was an accounting major in college back in the day, uh, there, I worked at the PCAOB, or that was my internship over the summer, the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, which, fun trivia question, is the only organization in the United States that's not technically a government organization. It's technically a private organization, but they have the authority to write laws. Hmm. So it's the only private organization that can write laws. They're monitored by the SEC, but they're not part of the SEC. They were created by the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Because that whole thing was, the whole thing with Enron was that their auditors, Arthur Anderson, they would straight up just hire their auditors immediately. They'd be like, okay, work at Arthur Anderson. Tell us that what we're doing is legit. And then you'll get a good fucking job at Enron right after. Mm -hmm. You know, like the relationship between the auditor and the actual company itself was so blurry. They'd be out partying with their auditors and taking them on vacations. And they needed to crack down on this. And... There's a lot of questions of what that meant. Like, should you pay your auditors? Should you be able to have a 35 year relationship with your auditing company? Like if you're a big company, Apple and say mm -hmm. like Ernst and Young has been the auditor of Apple for 35 years, should they have to have a different company audit them? Should you force a rotation mm -hmm. off? Is that a good thing or a bad? Like there's a lot of interesting, um, like legal regulatory questions in that realm. But anyway, um, yeah, so the, the, as things were devolving for Joe Lowe, they said he was getting sketched out, keeping his money in banks, because as you know, freedom darts have unlimited reach. And if you piss off the DOJ, they can throw a freedom dart around the world and go trace down your bank accounts and things. And he was like, okay, so I'm, I got a lot of money that is maybe shadily acquired. Like, how do I, how do I hide it? Mm -hmm. And one of the answers that people of this status do is you buy expensive art. So he went to art auctions and bought $40 million Basquiat paintings. I think they said like he bought well, at the time the most expensive painting in the world. It was a Basquiat painting that he spent $45 million on. And this is so crazy to me. So what do you do with your $45 million painting? Well, you need to keep it in pristine thing because you're not buying it as an art collector. You're buying it as a store of wealth because you know it's valuable and it's very scarce and you can always resell it. But it's small and like you can just put it somewhere. So you put it in this place that is called Geneva Freeport in Geneva, Switzerland. And it's a massive warehouse where people like Joe Lowe that buy $45 million pieces of art, you put it under lock and key 
So you actually, they give you humidified rooms that are like the perfect temperature for preserving art. You put it in a crate where like you can't even see the front of it. And you put it behind like armed guards in this warehouse. And they said that there's over a thousand Picassos in this one building that just the global elite are using to store their wealth. Holy crap, what an amazing idea. I thought of it when I tweeted this because I said this idea is beautifully dystopian because it is. It's You have what is essentially the greatest art museum in the world. They said that if Geneva Freeport, which is a warehouse in Switzerland, was open to the public, it would be a better art museum than the Louvre. Like the total uh, wealth of the art that's there is greater than the Louvre. And you have literally a society that we have on, in the earth that the creative output from the most creative individuals, the highest level of creative output is literally behind armed guards to prevent people from looking at it. That is fucking insane. Yeah, that's true. What a f I cannot believe that's a real thing. I honestly cannot believe that's a real thing. Like it, it's literally a like anti pattern for society, like a global society yeah. to take your creative works and put them in a warehouse with armed yeah. security guards to stop people from looking at them. Yeah, yeah. What an insane situation. I did not know about this place. Oh my god. Th this blew my mind. This is a thing. Yeah, that's true. And it also made me even more bullish on Bitcoin than I normally am and mm. I'm quite bullish on Bitcoin because it's like oh my god dude just buy Bitcoin <laughs> like, like you know yeah and you realize there's so much nefarious wealth that having something like Bitcoin that's easy to store and transfer is just so valuable if what they're doing is literally like taking art out of the world to and putting it in lock and key oh my god that, that was the craziest anecdote I thought of the book there's so many though yeah that's true you bought Miranda Kerr a million dollar necklace. How do you even spend a million dollars on one necklace, man? This must be the dopest necklace in the world, right? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. And then he uh, now Miranda Kerr is married to Evan Spiegel. I See also had the idea that in the end of the book, they start talking about how one of the things that Joe Lowe was prioritizing was making good relations between Malaysia and the United States. And that Obama was playing golf with Najib. Wasn't that his name? I think so. The prime minister of Malaysia. Yeah, yeah. And then at the end of it, Malaysia starts getting a better relationship with China. And then all this bad stuff happened to Joe Lowe. But or so. Or rather, all this, stuff, all this bad stuff happened to Joe Lowe, like him getting caught. And then Malaysia gets a better relationship with China as a result of that. But I was thinking to myself, what if the causality was in the reverse? if Malaysia starts getting a better relationship with China, and then the DOJ is like, well, fuck this Joe Lowe guy. Let's like prosecute him because like <laughs> we don't have to like pretend we like him anymore or something like that. Yeah, it was interesting, that dynamic. So I guess um, Malaysia is an Islamic country and they had never had like, a very like highly recognized um, political process, I suppose. I'm not super well versed in history, but they said it was a big deal that Obama wanted to like make like a model of Malaysia as like a cool um, Islamic democracy that's modern in the world and like let's promote them. And just him going and to Malaysia, he was the first U.S. president to go to Malaysia in like a hundred years or something, yeah, something or something like, that. like this. And then he was like playing golf with the Malaysian prime minister, which was a huge deal. I mean, it's so interesting how those are like big deals if like you decide to play golf with this yeah, guy yeah. versus not. Um, yeah, and then this prime minister that he hyped up ended up being quite corrupt because Joe Lowe obviously took this money and funded his re-election campaign because he needed the guy in power because he didn't want the other guy to... Yeah, and that guy yeah. needed him. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it was so interesting. I and... think it's also funny about Singapore. So initially, Singapore was part of Malaysia, but they were like, no way we're going to be in one country with these idiots. And then they just had some independence war where they just kicked the shit out of Malaysia. They had a like, physical war for their later, independence? Later, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. What year is this? Like right after the British left. Because Singapore is right on this Strait of Malacca, which is, if you're bringing oil from the Gulf in, into China, you have to bring it through the Ch South China Sea. And if you don't go through Singapore in the Strait of Malacca, you have to go around Indonesia through Jakarta. It takes much more time. And so this is like the most strategic point to control in <laughs> Like, like a lot of the world's global shipping lanes, like the Strait of Hormuz, but yeah. like with Iran and so on. Because if you can lock it down, then you can like really screw over China. I didn't know there was a physical war for Singapore's independence, though. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. And everyone in Singapore has to join the military for two years. I like that, though. I think that they should do this in the U.S. So 
I know in, in China, it's the same way. You have to do some sort of military service, but it doesn't necessarily have to be military. It can be just for the government, I think. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's stupid, man. I don't want to do stupid military service. No, I think it's awesome, though, because you should have to do some sort of service for your country. It could be working at an embassy or um, working at a State Department or working for some government organization. But I think if you mandated like two years of some sort of government service, like you could have much more cohesive ideas of nation states than we do now in the US because people like they haven't they haven't like really been indoctrinated with that idea. And it's also cool. It's like, oh, what do you do with your two years? Like, what do you do when you're, you're freshman in college? You like drink in a garage and, you know, in a frat house and just get wasted and don't learn anything. How is that a good use of your time versus, you know, serving your country in some way? Uh, I don't know. It could be pretty dumb, too. For instance, my friend is from Iran and he was saying that one of his friends that had to do this military service, there is just one room and then another room. And then third, and he was stationed in this middle room. He had to take requests from this one guy, bring it across the room, and give it to this other guy. But that's a lack of vision, for man. Two years. That's a lack of vision that they don't deploy. You get assigned to it. It's not like you can. No, I know, but not his vision, but the vision of whoever's organizing these programs. They have more labor than they know what to do with. Yeah, sure, but imagine you had to do something stupid like that. That'd be terrible. So I had an Arabic teacher that was Chinese, and he, I was like, how, how do you know Arabic? And he had worked when he had to do this mandatory service for the Gervis. He worked in the embassy in Syria. It's so cool, like as a young Chinese national to go learn Arabic in Syria for two years while working at the embassy. And then like you would never do that on your own. Why not? Volition. I don't know. I guess people just aren't wired that way. Like a lot of people need a nudge. Some people are ambitious and want to do that, but some people just need the nudge and the framework to do it. They'll just kind of do whatever the framework allows for. And if the framework is just getting drunk in a basement for two years, that's what they're going to do. And if the framework is go to an embassy and learn another language, that's what they'll do. Maybe. I don't know. I some don't think that some really people helps. drive on their own. Some people drive on the tracks. And if the tracks are just like steered towards something more productive, it's probably good. So I don't know. I'm not against the idea. I like in Israel that everyone has to do it. I think it's cool. I don't. I think all Israelis hate it too. Like most of my <laughs> friends from Israel are like pissed that they had to do it because they had to just waste two years doing boring bullshit. Yeah, it's probably better to travel. If you're in a small country like Israel where like your world is very small, probably traveling in that time would be really good. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. All right. Um, do you want to say anything else about Billion Dollar Whale before we break and talk about China's second continent? Um, only that I think these books are, I was thinking a little bit they were unrelated, this and China's second continent and the oligarchs, but actually I think that they are related. And that it seems to be the case that as you read more books, then even things that are seemingly disparate can weave together into this coherent narrative of your picture of how the world works. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, I also think it helps you. I was thinking about this question too, um, how you become a better systems thinker. If someone posed that to me, like I wouldn't know how to answer it. But then I was thinking reading a lot of books is probably a very good way to a really good thing you could do to start thinking better at a systems level, because you start to see each book is its own plot. But they all are about, if you read nonfiction, they're all about the same history. You know, it's the same sort of history. They're just different threads, and then they come and intertwine. Right. So seeing the plots and then seeing the points where they intertwine and seeing the points where they diverge help you think of the world in a more systems-oriented way as opposed to just in your narrative, but actually abstract it out into how the systems of the world interact with each other. Yeah, totally. And then yeah. Joe Lowe. Joe Lowe himself is an oligarch, kind of. And then Jolo is also related, and this story in Malaysia to China's like moving overseas and like developing like outposts in foreign countries. He and so is on. an oligarch, but he also it's so interesting how he did it versus so the oligarchs. The when we will talk about this book in a minute. Well, I guess I don't know. We could talk about it now if you want. But the whole premise, the oligarchs, was such an interesting book because the whole premise of this book was so Soviet communism existed through. Um, whatever, for since basically 1911 to 1989. And then it failed. Like the communist system was going to collapse and there was going to be a free market economy in Russia. And what the hell did that mean? I mean, they, they call it, um, what was it? It was like mass privatization or like rapid privatization. They're gonna privatize their economy like instantaneously. And there were a group of people that saw this opportunity and just, took it to a level, you know? They're like, this is a once in a lifetime kind of opportunity. It's a land grab. People don't even know, the, the, the concepts were so far into them. Hey, what, is, what does it mean that you can own part of a company that you don't even work at? How does that make any sense? Like what is equity yeah, yeah. in a company? And what is owner, private ownership of business? 
And there was just so much opportunity. And those people like kind of saw that opportunity and invested hard in it. Whereas Joe Lowe didn't, there wasn't like any specific opportunity they took advantage of. He just kind of looked at the way the system already worked and was just like, I wonder how I can hack this to my advantage, you know? Yeah, there wasn't a paradigm shift. Right, exactly. It was just looking at an uh, ossified system and just finding leverage and pressure points on it. Yeah, but he organized for himself the kind of relationship with the government and so on that those late stage oligarchs had like Berezovsky when he was like trying to you know talk with Gorbachev and figure out who's going to be the next president and auction off these companies and blah 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 yeah um let's break for a second and then we'll talk about the oligarchs in China's second continent a little bit so coming back to the oligarchs I think the story there are these six guys in early um Soviet Union that all became super wealthy I think I think they're probably all on the top, like at least at the time, the top hundred wealthiest people in yeah, the world. Yeah, but now many of them are dead. They've been assassinated. Yeah, and the man, just the the thing that I found really interesting about this book was thinking about the analogs to the cryptocurrency ecosystem in 2017. Obviously, it was a much bigger scale that the opportunities in Russia presented, but just that idea of a completely new paradigm and the information asymmetry and people not really understanding how the economy worked and just the leverage you could have if you understood a little bit of information. And You know, I think it relates to cryptocurrency is remember they told the story of Khodorkovsky and uh, Bank Menetep in the beginning, how he started out by they had these two things in Soviet Union, this Nelichia, which I think means cash. And this da David Hoffman said they had this other thing called Beznelichia, which is just not cash. And it was some accounting mechanism that they would have on factories. And so Hodorkovsky just went around collecting this fake cash. And everyone thought it was worthless. And he was like, yeah, just give me all your fake cash. And they're like, OK. And then he just figured out a way to turn this fake cash into oil and like real products. <laughs> and so that's perfect analogy. It's like Bitcoin and Ethereum because it's like there was this fake money. Everyone thought it was just a joke. And people went around and been like, yeah, just give me your fake money. And people were like, OK. And so then they turned it into real money. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Anything that has scarcity attached to it, if you meme it correctly, people could conceivably want to pay for it. Yeah. People turn baseball cards into money, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Things like that. Uh, it was interesting. Um, I really like the story of the 1996 election that they put in this, because I am i was not well-versed in this. I didn't really know the story. But I guess once these guys became essentially oligarchs in Russia, um, the Yeltsin, who is the president, who is the pro um, pro-capitalism, I guess you would say, and he had traveled to the U.S. and seen the U.S. and was kind of, we wanted to make Russia more Western, and the U.S. supported his regime. And the guy eventually in 1996 that runs against him, I forget his name, but he was a communist. And he's like, okay, these capitalists are like screwing us over. Let's go back to communism. So the way that modern Russian ecosystem... Is it like Pokhorov or something like that? No. He was... Miguel Pro or Mikhail Prokhorov is a guy that was in this book, and I know him because he bought the New Jersey Nets uh, at some point, and he was like a big figure in the NBA. But um, the the idea, though, I thought was really interesting. So now that you have a communist running against Yeltsin, and they're like, okay, well, we're rich as fuck from the opportunities that we saw in mass privatization over the last five years. And if we go back to communism, we're going to lose all that wealth and money, right? So we need Yeltsin to win. And it was the first time that it was, okay, um, we're going to help you win. And it was that kind of, oh, wow, the oligarchs are really running the show here, you know? Yeah, <laughs> but it's also this weird balancing act. So there's the oligarchs, but then there's also these guys like Anatoly Chubais and... Who's the politician, Yeltsin. yeah. Yeah, Chubais is like the economics minister or something. Yeah. And they're all kind of helping each other <laughs> navigate this weird world. Yeah, it was interesting something that they said that um they basically he made rtv um which was the russian television station or something yeah or, kaczynski did that right yeah but they made it as because they made it big during the chechen war by neutrally covering the chechen war so one of my friends that i knew in germany his family is from russia but then they immigrated to <laughs> germany after the Berlin Wall collapsed. So many Jewish families that clearly did this, like immigrated to Germany after, because there was ex exit quotas or what, how to call it, like uh, emigration quotas on Jews in the Soviet Union, <laughs> and you had to pay back the government for all the shit you got. Like if you went to school, public school, you had to pay them money because it's like, oh, you owe them for going to public school. Isn't that so fucked? When was that policy? In the Soviet Union. Oh wow. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay, so know. anyway, yeah. like, <laughs> I was talking with him once, and I said Chechen rebels, and he said, "Oh my god," he like went ape shit, and he was like, uh, <laughs> "It pisses him off so much that in the U.S. they call them Chechen rebels when they're just clearly terrorists." <laughs> so they would like go into theaters yeah. and like start killing people and stuff, and it's just like, but in the U.S. media, they always call them Chechen rebels. Yeah, it, it's yeah, it's, it's hilarious how poorly or obviously slanted U.S. media covers yeah. foreign wars. With the, well, they do this in Syria also. Mm -hmm. They call the rebel, like, they call Al Qaeda, like, Syrian rebels and things. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, the thing that I thought was interesting was they, they had these neutral TV stations. They were relatively neutral. And what ended up happening is because they needed Yeltsin to win so badly, they gave him a full platform to just be like, tell, like, you control this station to win your reelection. And they thought it was like a temporary thing, but kind of once you open that, rabbit like once you open that bag it doesn't go back in and now you know the government got used to the idea that we kind of control the tv station and the programming there but it all stems from this 1996 election in russia which i, I just didn't realize the context of it i thought it was awesome super interesting all right what are the what are your other thoughts about that book so it's i was saying this to you jordan like before it's very interesting because this guy david hoffman he presents kind of comprehensive picture kind of of this transition between soviet you could say communism or whatever that thing that they were doing there was and the modern russia but it's very high level and he introduces these characters in such a weird way and like kind of superficially covers them and i was thinking how interesting it would be if i was russian and then i was reading some story about for instance something that happened to the united states like the vietnam war or Richard Nixon's presidency or something, and there was just some one journalist who's introducing all the characters and saying, this guy's like this, and this guy's like this. And then I would believe them, and I would see this picture like, but such from such a limited perspective. So I'm sure that, like, this guy Luzhkov, there must be a million things about him that you would just know if you grew up in Russia. Like, we know about Rudy Giuliani. Like, all these things. He's important mayor of New York. He does all this different stuff. And he's, like, helping Trump, blah, blah, blah. Like, Luzhkov, probably the same. But we only know this one thing that this David Hoffman guy is telling us. And Hodorkovsky, the same. Like, all of these characters, he, like, this guy, David Hoffman, obviously has his own biases, you know? And so I feel like our vision of what Russian history is like and how it's unfolding is just so skewed and so superficial and one-dimensional. Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, it's like what you say that you've told me this before, that each person needs to have their, you know, elevator pitch, essentially. Yeah, yeah. And he's just giving the elevator pitch of all these people as opposed to the actual, like, context behind it. Yeah, it, I got the sense that I wanted to learn more um, about, like, just more in-depth about the characters from reading this book, but... Yeah, it was, it was really good. The thing, I wanted to say something else also, but I'm blanking on what it was. Oh, yeah, I was saying this. I think this should be a TV show. I think that this story of the, basically what happened in a three-year period from 1989 to 1992 in Russia is so interesting of, hey, guys, communism's going to end. There's going to be something that replaces it. There's going to be a ton of opportunity. And the people that just kind of had the vision and the ambition to go all in on it and find the easy money and find the leverage, it's a fascinating story. And it would be an awesome TV show. Like there were so many cool plot points and secret meetings and them having to learn like about Swiss bank accounts for the first time and blah, 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 and like become that oligarch. Yeah, but it's the less interesting TV show. Honestly, it's like, okay, in 1990s, basically you had two choices. It's like a fork. It's like some people can go to Russia and try to be pioneers in Russia doing all of that stuff. And I think many people in the U.S. chose this. So some of my also relatives and family friends and anything just tried to start some businesses in Russia in the 90s, all failed. Why? But likewise, if they had been a little bit smarter and understood a little bit more about how the world works, or maybe just even a little bit luckier, they would have gone to China. So everyone who went to China, I feel like now, is just rolling in it so rich. And everyone who went to Russia got scammed and almost like maybe killed and stuff like this. And so it's like... They went to Russia because, like, oh, yeah, Russia, they're also kind of Europeans, and so blah, blah, blah. Oh, and there was a dynamic event, probably, the Berlin Wall There was Wall also fall. a dynamic event in China. So, like, Deng Xiaoping's opening up, Mao Zedong dies, and, like, China's going through this. What year did Mao Zedong die? In the 19, same time, like, 1989? Yeah, something like 80s. Yeah, but I feel like it wasn't as... Because well, probably we weren't at war with them in the Cold War, right? Like, Russia was hyped up in the Cold War for so long, and then when the Berlin Wall falls, everyone just has this idea in their head that this is where you need to be. It's kind of like now with, uh, I mean, this will segue into China's economy with Africa. Like, obviously the move, if you wanted to get Baller Rich five years ago, is to go to Africa. There's I don't so... think so. Oh, totally. I don't think so. It might be now. I don't think so. I've thought about it. Um, all right, well, we can segue into that. But my point was, I thought that it would be a really cool TV show in the U.S. to paint the Russian oligarchs that we always hear about in the news as, like, some sort of evil entity yeah. as kind of an inception story that has a little anti-hero tent to it, but, like, is kind of a... a 
it paints them more as like legendary figures that I wouldn't had even watch that show i would watch that show if it was from russia but i feel like if we did it in the u.s it would just be a joke and like a caricature of all these people no like, that's why i think it'd be an interesting way to not make it that like to do a really good version of it would I be think cool it's impossible like you could only do this show by like some dudes that grew up in russia and understand the context of all this stuff i feel like there's no american guy that could do it justice all right fair enough all right you wanna all right, let, uh, let's segue into the china second comment so wait wait there's more interesting oh, stuff to okay, say about cool. oligarchs like for instance Hodorkovsky. like people are always i've watched this documentary which was so pro Hodorkovsky and so anti-putin at one point and they were saying yeah Hodorkovsky, he's such a liberal guy trying to liberalize russia and then putin put him in jail for all this stuff and so, but then you read this story and you just hear how in the foreign debt crisis in Russia, Hodorkovsky borrowed hundreds of millions of dollars from Goldman Sachs and he's just like, nah, later, I'm not going to pay that off, suck it. And then he just like transfers all the ownership of Yukos into like these shell companies and stuff. So amazing. And such a scammer too, you know? So I thought that was super interesting. And yeah, there's just like a million things to say about this book. But, oh, also that they didn't talk anything about Gorbachev, who's the guy who started this whole process, which is really interesting. I read a biography of Gorbachev, which I thought was great. And he and Yeltsin were like super enemies, which is an interesting dynamic. And Yeltsin also tried to kill himself once. I thought this was fascinating. So one time, uh, Gorbachev just embarrassed the shit out of Yeltsin in the Duma or something like this. And Yeltsin went up to his office and tried to kill himself with a letter opener. And so I thought this was so interesting because he then went on to become president of Russia. So it's like, anytime I embarrass myself really badly or do something really dumb, I think about this moment and I'm like, yeah, so I just really messed up and did this stupid embarrassing thing, but whatever, because Boris Yeltsin once tried to kill himself with a letter opener and then became president <laughs> of Russia. So it's not that bad. It's great. If that works for you, I think that's kind of cool. <laughs> Oh man, yeah, it, it's a cool book. I, I I don't know that much about Russia, but it's a good way to get started into it. All right, I want to talk about China's second country. All right, all right, let's do it. So this is the premise of this book. This book also, I think, this might be the my favorite book that I've read in 2019 so far, so through six weeks. Um, the premise of it is this journalist named Howard French, who I guess is just some, like, it, honestly, he strikes me as just some normie Washington Post journo, but he had this cool experience where he went all around Africa. He for, grew up in Africa. So I guess he, yeah, he might have grown up there, but he goes around for multiple years, I guess. And he interviewed Chinese entrepreneurs that are in various countries in Africa. And this is across like six or seven co countries that this book takes place. It's funny because he's like totally a Rudyard Kipling-esque colonialist child, in my opinion. But he's more SJW-ish than Rudyard Kipling because Rudyard Kipling was thinking that the British Raj was just this great, amazing thing. But Howard French is very anti. Yeah, and it, the the story is fascinating because I guess this is the whole idea, right? The whole idea is during the Cold War, Africa was kind of neglected, let's say. No, it wasn't. It was like a chessboard. It was so interesting. Oh, it was. I know. But but the investment in Africa wasn't. Like, no, they, it wasn't. It was a fucking chessboard, man. It was so interesting. So you had like South Africa and they were the ally of the United States and the West. And so even though they had this apartheid and all this horrible stuff, then the U.S. didn't care. And so they even gave nuclear weapons to South Africa. <laughs> and then South Africa invaded, oh, what did they invade? This former Deutsch Southwest Africa, what's it called? Namibia? Yeah, they yeah. invaded Namibia and all this stuff. But then Mozambique was this communist country right near them, and so was Angola. And yeah, it's so interesting, right? And then they're giving money to all the different uh, rebel factions, like Katanga and stuff like this. It's so interesting. And then the Cold War ends, and then they stop caring about Africa. They're just like, well, whatever. And then they even, South Africa is the only country that had nuclear weapons and gave them up. Because the U.S. is like, okay, give us our nuclear weapons back. <laughs> we don't need you. Cold War's over. Yeah. yeah. That's actually awesome. Yeah, I remember I once looked up. So if you look at a map of Africa, there's a, on the left side, there's just like um, an area that's shaded out. And it just says Western Sahara. And this always oh, yeah. fascinated me when I was just in college looking at maps and things. You're like, wait, how is it this is part of the world that people are just shading out? Like, don't worry about this part. And it, it has some Cold War inception story where Morocco was... Um, and Spain. Yeah, Morocco and uh, Algeria were separate Cold War. I forget who... I think Algeria is with the Russians and Morocco is with the U.S. maybe. Yeah. And um, the, there was like some proxy battle there with Western Sahara being leveraged as some chip. And there's like an independence movement there, but no one really cares about it because it's a desert. And somehow it's still an unallocated piece of land that's not technically part of any country. Yeah, but Spain also claims it. 
They did for a while. They got yeah, kicked yeah. out. I think they have no claim. It's Morocco claims it. And then there's a Polisario independence movement. But it's just so fascinating. Look at a map of Africa. There's an area that's shaded out. And it's just not a country. It's not part of the UN. Right? It's amazing. But yeah, that's... You know what else is interesting yeah. about Africa? Is that the British had an explicit policy of trying to make a railroad that went north to south. And the French had a policy of trying to make an air a railroad that went west to east. Who, who succeeded? None of them, neither. But like, <laughs> you can see how their colonies kind of yeah. look like this. Yeah. It's like playing tick like that. Yeah, but anyway, I guess, okay, so you're right. It wasn't neglected, but yeah, it, maybe... It was, though, in the 90s. After yeah, the Cold War was after over, the Cold War. then they didn't care. And then it just evolved into civil wars, and every single country went crazy apeshit with, like, horrible wars right. for the whole so, 90s. Right, but it was neglected until, kind of, they said in the last decade, so... Let's say from 2009 to 2000, uh, when was this book written? 2016 or something? So yeah, maybe something like that. 2006 to 2016, that there were a million immigrants from China into Africa, which is really interesting. And I think that the, the narrative he paints, and obviously it's probably different on a case by case basis, but the overall narrative he paints is that China is such a high growth, high pressure economy right now. And some people don't, and like it's hard to capture the value of what you create because it has this communist system that a lot of wealth accrues to the top. I, I'm not, like, I can't speak to the, the specifics. Or what I also liked about it was because you and I had just read the Three Body Problem too, and it talks about this lost generation of the uh, Cultural Revolution where they just sent some kids out of school to live in the countryside and just have this no education. But then now these guys are adults and they have they can't even read some of them. And they're just like, what the hell? There's no place for me in this normal, like, normie China. I'm out of here. And then they'd go to Africa and just set up these little empires for themselves because they survived the Cultural Revolution. They're badasses. And they're like, must be obviously smart, even though they can't like read or do math or something like this. Who cares about that? But they like set up these little kingdoms for themselves and like Mozambique and everything. It's so interesting. Yeah. And it's a million people that had come from China to Africa and some are being quite successful with entrepreneurial ventures because the governments in Africa seem to care about well, they, they paint a lot of different pictures because they obviously have experience with colonialism that maybe didn't work out like in any beneficial way for the African countries. So they paint some of them as like the African governments are like, we've tried everything. So fuck it. We'll try Chinese entrepreneurs. Like what, what, what do we have to lose? That's like one uh, thing to do. They also painted it as, um, I don't know, I guess some governments were just super chill. Like, yeah, we don't worry. Like as long as like they were talking about this anecdote with some guy that they talked to in Liberia, where he's the guy responsible for giving land to, in any business and he'll just give um chinese entrepreneurs land in liberia like acres and he's like i'm not even gonna tax you for it just if you're hiring liberians i'm cool with it and then like three years from now if you're making money i'll come back and take my vig mm. but it just seems like this really i don't know like more chill attitude with like less regulatory pressure and like we said this, this like there's always a wild west of the world for entrepreneurs in some respect and it was the wild west in california and then a lot of people went to Central America when that got too normy. But it really seems like Africa is the that now. That if you just want the no regulation and just kind of can do I don't think it's Africa. Where do you, where do you think it is? <laughs> Not Africa. Like, I just think that it always seems like it's this, but never is this. Like, it's the same thing. Like, the Boers thought it was that. Like, you know, when they went and, like, tried to create South Africa, it wasn't like that. And then, like, I don't know. Like, I think it always appears this way. It never is. I don't know. It seems like it is because the, well, most of the population growth of the world is going to be from Africa. I know. There's always a million reasons why. And but I don't think so. Most of the GDP growth is probably going to be, like, all, all these countries are going to modernize. What about and... Myanmar or something like that? I'm much more bullish about Burma or whatever. Yeah, but uh, the, uh, yeah, I, I guess, but I don't know. It, the, the, okay, anyway, the, the book was super interesting in the respect that he just is on all these different countries just kind of talking to the entrepreneurs themselves and the like i got a lot personally out of just um i guess like uh absorbing the vibe that the characters in this book put off of hey we are going to find the leverage point of the world that allows us to create the lifestyle that we want and we're just going to go chase it even if it requires you know building a really uh, a business we've never think like owning a copper mine in you know Angola. Like, yeah, that's yeah. What we're and do. this is, this is the way that they're yeah. the same like Joe Lowe and the same like the oligarchs because they're like I don't care about like any of these limitations. I just want to live my best life and I'm going to find the place where I can do that and then I'm going to do it to the max. You know what's interesting in this book because they they do pull out some numbers in different sections, and he's talking about the salary that they pay Namibian or like Angolan workers to work in this mine, and it was something like forty dollars a week. 
Mm. And I was just remember thinking, damn it, man. Like, so like a engineer in Silicon Valley can make like 75 X that, and is your labor actually worth 75 X? What someone that's working in this mine is doing? Probably not. Probably yes. You think 75 X, like even if it's some multiplier, that number just seemed really high to me. Well, also you have to consider the purchasing power of different currencies and stuff. So in this, whatever Namibian currency, probably 40 bucks is like actually translating into this. And then there's all these barriers from getting dollars into that currency. And then like, you know, so like maybe, yeah, but it made me really think when you're, when you're like doing the math that there might be a bit of a bubble in the West in terms of just the lifestyle and salary from the input and output like of your mind versus other places. Like maybe you do have a benefit because you know, whatever like you're working in a field that you have more leverage in and where you're just a replaceable labor component. But at a multiplier like 75x, when you're just like looking at the numbers, you're like, fuck, I think it's a bubble. Like, I think that it's going to have to normalize. I don't think so. I don't, because I think you're not considering other factors, like the way that currencies are valued against each other and stuff like this, because those guys are probably getting paid in this Namibian currency was probably dog shit. And it's like all the time fluctuating and like has no stable value compared to dollars. So like, you know what I mean? There's so much, like, I don't think this is a meaningful comparison when they make these one-to-one -one mappings between this currency and that currency and people's salaries. Yeah, I guess that's true. I just, I guess it's just like shocking to see the absolute numbers and just be like, do the math on your napkin and be like, yeah, they know am I, shocking, but, but I'm thinking it from the perspective of me of like, am I secure with my job or, or like my lifestyle decision or is the world just going to normalize around me and I need to do something? You know, I just, I don't know. I, th this thought isn't really going anywhere, but I was just thinking out loud kind of. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I think having money in a currency is always scary because it's just a number. Like what they were saying about in the Soviet Union, you're some engineer, you save all of your rubles, and then the government just decides those rubles are worth nothing. And then <laughs> your salaries, your savings of your life are gone. I like so this, crazy. the thing that they did in the book when I guess the ruble had inflated so high that people had $20,000 banknotes, and they just decided as a country that they were going to just take everyone's rubles yeah. and just cross off three zeros from them. Or that there's like a take some bills out of circulation and India did this recently. There's like a stock split where they're like the number, like we don't want people to look at $20,000 bills because it reminds them of inflation. So like, screw that. We're just going to call these $20 bills now. Yeah, <laughs> I thought that was such an interesting thing that happened. Yeah, it's interesting. And then he was saying that it's also the same exchange rate as a French franc. Like they would probably try to do that on purpose. This is current, like international currency stuff is so weird. I don't get it at all. It's crazy. Dude, I really want to go to Africa after reading this book. It just seems... You went to Africa. I was in South Africa. That's not really Africa. <laughs> I, I mean, I guess it is, but... Yeah, I don't know. It felt, it, it felt more like a colony, I guess, than... Interesting. The rest of Africa, I would imagine, feels. What about, like, Egypt? I feel like Egypt would feel like Africa. You think so? Yeah, I think so. But it's also, the, it's also the Middle East. Like, yeah. if you, I mean, it's not like, it, I feel like, I feel like, yeah, maybe it feel, but I've never really been in the Middle East either, except for Israel yeah. and, and Dubai, UAE and Dubai, yeah, okay. but that is also, <laughs> no, but I just mean South Africa feels like an international city the way any international city would feel. But I imagine if you went to Addis Ababa, yeah, 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 like that would not feel like an international city. It would feel like, oh, I'm in Ethiopia or something. Yeah, because you would be in Ethiopia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my points are maybe not so great now. But yeah, I don't know. Uh, I really just like the energy of this book because I felt Howard French, you could see, like you could totally get a taste of his biases than like what he is as an author. But I feel like he just kind of let people speak for themselves in this book. And it's just such a cool thing to do. It's like, let me go around Africa talking to Chinese entrepreneurs about what they're doing and what their vibe is and what their mindset is. And it's so interesting. I don't know. I think he's pretty anti-China, basically, was the vibe I got from this book and pro-Western, although these Western countries are doing the same stuff. And he just takes this really annoyingly anti-China line on everything and then just writes all this really insulting stuff about all these people who are hanging out with him, these Chinese guys. And... I thought that that whole part was, was pretty cool. cringeworthy. Because I guess the question is, okay, is this Chinese investment in Africa going to end up like colonialism China style, or is it going to end up actually benefiting the people in Africa? And that's kind of an undetermined question. But it was so interesting, the thought of the dynamic of Chinese style colonialism in Africa, 
where it's okay so like americans come in and they build some dope bridge and they call it like the jfk freedom bridge yeah, yeah and china comes in and build a bridge and they call it a friendship bridge like not named after you know it's just right, right. it's like a, a riff on the american playbook but just slightly different yeah i think it's fascinating because i was always asking people this when i was in china or in germany meeting guys from africa and i would always ask them about this paradigm because i read this book when i was living in hong kong and uh yeah it's interesting one of my friends for instance said he was from ethiopia and he told me that the way that they did was the chinese companies would come and they would build really great roads that go straight to a mine and then like right to a port and they would build the port really nice too and then they would just you know export all that stuff so <laughs> Oh man, um, yeah, it's cool. All right, any other thoughts about the, these books? Um, not that. Oh, I like this idea too. So going on this idea of um, China being cool, so to speak, because you think about this, there aren't really Chinese brands in the U.S. that have uh, status almost. Yeah. Are there like barely even American brands that have status? You know, it's mostly like, for fashion. It's mostly European, um, but I guess for other things, there are definitely like Apple's super high status and mm. things like that. But there really aren't Chinese products with status. Like you buy things from China because they're cheap or like they're useful, but not because they're considered like luxury goods or whatever. Mm. But I like this idea that it's almost like a warfare maneuver for the Chinese government to invest in building consumer markets in Africa that buy Chinese goods directly because like this lack of status of Chinese brands means even if things are getting made in China or built in China or they're part of the supply chain, the end kind of branding is always somewhere else in the world. And that's what people seek out. Mm -hmm. But if they can build new consumer markets in Africa that directly want Chinese goods because they can just like pipe it directly to them because they're new markets, that's kind of an interesting, you know, global strategy for them to fight against the West is let's develop consumer markets on our own brands that we sell directly into them and just circumvent the fact that we have to build for other brands, you know? I thought that was an interesting idea. And I also, wait, okay, that point was interesting. Wait, what was my second point though? I had a second point for this. I don't remember. <laughs> One of the things that I think about when I think about this China second continent paradigm is something I said to you before about rock music. So if you think about European music, it doesn't have much, if any, drums. So Mozart or anything is all about harmony. But then African music is only drums, basically. So when you have the United States, you have this European harmonic music and African drum-based music come together and make rock and roll. And I was thinking about the fact that in Guangzhou, there's hundreds of thousands of African immigrants living there now. And that they, so Chinese have a kind of musical scales, which are different than Western musical scales. And I wonder how this will interact. So it's African beats, so to speak, and Chinese music styles. That's really interesting. Coming together and making a whole new genre of music. That's a really cool idea. Do they really use different scales in China? Yeah, yeah. Wow, it's not just like extra notes. It's like literally the major scales are different. I think so. Like, That's so interesting. In India, yeah. they do too. They have this weird sitar and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, they, well, they use, um, they have more granularity on the notes. So the musical scale in the US, like each note is um, maybe three hertz apart. But I think in India, Indian music, it's like one hertz apart. So like, it's just more granular. That's where you get those quarter notes, the uh, you know, it's uh. like, like you hit those, in, in, like there's just notes just aren't used in Western music to be in between notes like that. You know, but on the sitar, I guess you get more granularity. You can do that. And that's why it sounds like that. Hmm. This is really interesting. I have to look at that. I agree with you that the African rhythm and Chinese scale, like that's such a cool idea musically. I also, okay, I remember one point I wanted to make also that I thought was interesting. So... They were talking with one guy, I forget which character in the book this was that was saying this stuff, but they were talking about this Confucius project that they have, a Confucius Institute in China. Oh, yeah. And the whole idea is, because it's so interesting, right? So I know people that grew, went to French schools growing up for elementary school. They're just all over the world. 
And it's in France's interest to just have French schools in other countries that yeah. people learn French at. And China is doing a similar thing now with this Confucius project. Confucius Institute. Con yeah, so the Confucius Institute. And they just have Chinese language schools that they're putting all throughout Africa the way you know you have missionaries in churches. It essentially is that. It's like Chinese culture missionaries. They that, have them in America too. I don't know anyone that went to that one though. Yeah, but they, many countries do this. There's also the Goethe Institute, the German one. Yeah, I, I think that that's probably like one of the model. Like that, that one's famous and there's a, a but it's so interesting because they were talking to this one guy and he's like, well, they're like, do you really think you can get people in Africa to speak Chinese? And he's like, well, don't they speak French in Mali? <laughs> and it's like, uh-oh. <laughs> like, yeah, this, yeah. <laughs> this, this might happen. You know? <laughs> yeah. I think it's so interesting, though, because there is this meme in the West that Chinese is this difficult thing to learn. But I lived in China, and I can speak Chinese. I could speak it much better when I was actively living there. Now I've forgotten a lot of it. But I remember I was in my elevator of my building reading a computer science textbook. And I showed it to this guy who's the super of my building. And he was like, oh, yeah, what are you reading? So I show him. And it was a book about programming in C or something like that. He goes, oh, that looks like Chinese to me. And I was thinking, yeah, me too, <laughs> you dumb fuck. Because I speak Chinese and I know how to program computers. Yeah, it, it, so interesting. Um, I'm very interested to read the follow-up to this book in 15 years. I just feel that that seeing how that project goes. And it also makes me really sad because he mentions this in the book, this book too. He said, OK, so China's, like, he just mentions it in like casual passing where he's like, well, the last 15 years, the U.S. has kind of spent all its money fighting wars in the Middle East. China's been developing Africa. And you're just like, damn, we should have been developing Africa. Why are we fighting the wars in the Middle East? You know, it's just one of those things. That's, that's what the U.S. did with their oh, empire yeah. leverage is like they got bogged down in the Middle East. And then all countries that have leverage that didn't get bogged down in the Middle East are like developing the shit out of Africa. Yeah, sure. But think about yeah. this. This is an interesting point, too, that he kind of touches on. <laughs> so the... Chinese People's Liberation Army doesn't engage in wars of foreign adventurism like America does in Middle East. But imagine when, after a period of decades, China has been investing in some government in something like South Sudan. And then there's some rebel faction that's trying to take over this government or overthrow it. And in Beijing, they're going to be like, fuck that. Like, we spent, like, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars building up this government. Like, you're not going to throw it over, you idiots. And so they just send the Chinese military to just go kill all those rebels. It's totally going to happen. I wonder when. Maybe in, like, 10 years or something like that. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that will be a paradigm shift when that, China starts going abroad to engage in wars like this. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I totally see, I, I understand your point, because it's like us when we developed governments in the Middle yeah. East to fight the Russians, and they were friendly to us, and then when people started getting stepping out of their lane, you know, freedom darts again. Yeah, but oh, also I don't like this thing of saying us, so it's like, what do you mean us? It's like, did you do that? Like, I don't care anything about, like, so the U.S. government is trying to fight some war in some country to do some interests for, like, which are not my interests, the Chinese government is still doing the same. It's like, I'm just interested in what is good for Matthew English and his family and friends, and yeah. Yeah, I, I feel that to some extent. You know, what do you, you know, it's not your problem, so to speak, that yeah. the U.S. government wastes its tax exactly. dollars. But I guess if you live in the U.S., you know, you want the country to succeed. And if you own a U.S. passport and your money's in dollar, like, you do kind of have equity in the actual enterprise of the United States. Yeah, like, like it's better for you. In the game. Yeah, it's better for you if it succeeds, but... And it like obviously the wars are not helping it succeed. <laughs> so yeah. like if there was a shareholders meeting, which is I guess what elections <laughs> are supposed to be, but it makes no sense because Donald Trump literally says like we're going to end the wars in the Middle East and then doesn't. But that's what you know it's like what leverage does those shareholders have? Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> like nothing happens. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know. Um, I I want America to be doing cool shit like developing Africa and making cool projects for Americans there. And Honestly, I don't care. It's like, if okay, if someone wants to build a dope city in Africa, that's cool. And it's like, if I can travel there and have fun there and go and do my thing there, that's cool too. And I don't care if it's America that does it or China. Do you think it'd be cool though if like, the government would pay you to like go fly to um, Kenya and teach people how to code and you, it's no, like part of that a... sounds boring. I don't want to do that. Really? It sounds kind of interesting. I don't want to do that. Like I think if someone wanted to go to Kenya and make a really cool city, that'd be great. And like I would go hang out there. Why not? And why do I care if it's like a Chinese Freedom Bridge or if it's the JFK Bridge? It makes to me no difference. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a fair point. I think it's an interesting way to look at the world. It's like saying, essentially saying your identity is just you yourself and you live in this world and that's you have your hundred percent you have your immutable characteristics but you don't have any collective this tribal identity yeah, yeah totally it's like yeah. i live in new york now but i could just as easily go live in singapore it's very easy to get a singapore passport after like two years of living there you could go to get a kids in nevis passport and whatever just chill yeah how useful is that thing though <laughs> i think Maybe it's not so. the worst singapore passport is actually really good too yeah singapore passport's good yeah but don't they, do they like kick you out if you're not working anymore or they let you just so. they let you just chill. Uh, I don't know if they let you just chill, but the thing is that they are constantly afraid that Malaysia is going to invade them again, so they need more people, so their population doesn't go down. Then they all put them in the military and stuff. Interesting. I know in Dubai they kick you out if you're not working, which I think is hilarious. Like I was in Dubai for a little bit, and there's no old people in Dubai. It's all working age population. It's just fascinating because they just throw people out when they're not contributing anymore. <laughs> Yeah. It's like an adult playground. That's the way that I think about it. I think it's kind of anti playground. Dubai? Dubai? What do you mean? Because you can't like drink on the streets? Yeah. Yeah, yeah but it, it's you're what you're witnessing its emergence. Because like they tried to be this super Islamic conservative entity and they're like, okay, you don't drink alcohol in Dubai. But then all the tourists went out because like, okay, you can drink alcohol but only at hotels. And now they're like, yeah, but you know, who's what to say what a hotel is, you know, anything with a bag <laughs> really be a hotel. Like, and, um, you know, they used to have no food during Ramadan. It's okay. It's Ramadan. You can't eat during the day. The whole city shuts down. And now it's, well, you know, we have a lot of people don't celebrate Ramadan here. We got to have stuff open. You know, yeah, it, yeah. it's just, you're watching that kind of emergence. I actually thought this was interesting too. When I was there, you'd see this like really interesting dichotomies of, for example, like girls wearing hijabs with. Apple watches sticking it, you know, just this really weird, like conservative, like technologically progressive clash of like ideas in one person. Yeah. So interesting, you know, um, like, like, uh, they have, they have like the most, um, expensive advanced Metro system, like the most beautiful train cars across the city that are separated by gender. You right. know, it's just, it's this really crazy construct. Um, Oh man, I don't even know how I got talking about this. <laughs> but, uh, anything else you you thought before we shut down? No. Okay, cool. These are all really good books, by the way. Yeah. Um, also, yeah. thanks Howard French for responding to our email to yeah. come on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, we'll shut it down and we will keep shipping. Yeah. Let's do it. All right. Sounds good. Peace.